IDC International Radio, 106.2 FM, from Israel to the world. Herzliya Conference. Herzliya Conference. Special interviews, highlights, and live broadcast on IDC Radio. Hello, welcome to 106.2 FM. You're listening to IDC International Radio, and we're here for the Herzliya Conference special. Um, with me in the studio today is Mr. Riyad Al Khouri from the Geoeconomica Political Risk Management. You are the director of the Middle East there. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi, good to be here. Thank you for coming. So, um, really, it's the start of the conference, and um, well, there's a lot going on, and there are a lot of questions we want to ask you. Um, but I'd say the Middle East seems totally, at the moment, fragmented and divided on on all different fronts. As an economist, um, do you see economic interaction to, to be a possible bridge or olive branch in the region? Yes, but of course, you know, it's much more complicated than that. To say that economic interaction provides a path to peace and, of course, to prosperity is true, but extremely difficult to achieve. And something very important here I should quickly add. This idea was first floated in the 90s. Economic peace theory. By the late Shimon Peres. And unfortunately, uh, it was uh, presented in the wrong way and applied in the wrong way with the result that we now see. I hope that the idea will reemerge in a new and proper way mm. that will allow us all to benefit. And how do you see that happening? I see, first of all, the very important need for a political settlement between the Palestinians and the Israeli government. This is key. Without this, there will never be any peace, let alone economic peace. This is the first step. After that, anything is possible, and I predict a great future for the region after Israeli-Palestinian just lasting and comprehensive peace has been achieved. So you have a quite a positive outlook. It's nice to hear. Um, many people have, you know, recently there's been this deal between Trump and Saudi Arabia, and many people have criticized the U.S., saying Trump is doing business with the wrong people and that Saudi Arabia is perhaps not as uh, pragmatic as we think. What do you make of this, especially in light of the recent announcement of the crown prince? Don't forget what uh, an American president once said about his country. The business of America is business. Therefore, for Trump, to be doing deals with the Saudis, with their huge economy, is natural. It's normal. That doesn't exclude him doing deals with others. But the argument is that if you're doing such a, if you're creating such a huge arms deal, perhaps um, as a liberal democracy, the U.S. has a responsibility. It's more than just business. It's not just trade. You know, if you're supplying someone with weapons and you're not sure of their intentions, is that a possible red line? I don't think America cares too much about liberal democracy mm -hmm. outside America. And the business factor, I repeat, is the overwhelmingly important one. If we approach America as an economic power and Americans as business people, everybody would be much happier. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess then that argument follows that perhaps democracy, this is, I mean, maybe it's a, already a well-established idea that the spread of democracy is not as easy or as successful as we'd like it to be. There is absolutely no way that you can, quote, spread democracy, unquote, in countries that are economically totally different from mm. the great democracies of the West. Yeah, it's a, I, I tend to agree. Um, now, if we look, if we are talking about Saudi Arabia, business deals, etc., I can't not ask about Qatar and the recent embargo or you know, diplomatic um, bust up between Qatar and, the, and, you know, a lot of the Arab countries. Can we predict a de-escalation or is this going to go worse? And do you think Qatar will be pushed further towards Iran on the spectrum? This is a huge show. You're right. Iran is involved. But this, to me, is totally insignificant. I have spent maybe a few minutes thinking about this since it started. And I predict that I may be back here soon. <laughs> uh, I predict that in our next interview, you won't even remember that really? there was a crisis in Qatar. Yes. So, but w so, w what are the motives of making this such a public? You know, it, it hasn't been hid away from the media at all. 
the media, and I say this with deep respect to you because <laughs> you are you are of the media, is becoming extremely important in our day. Therefore, what used to be something insignificant or even hidden, something that was not apparent, something that was kept secret, not broadcast, etc., is now out in the open. Mm. Uh, I'm on Facebook, and I know what my Facebook friends have for breakfast this morning. <laughs> So th this, is, uh, this is a medium. It's a part of the social media. The noise, and I use the word noise advisedly, being made about Qatar is part of the process. This, uh, quote, crisis, unquote, is something that exists largely, not entirely, largely in the media. So th that is not surprising. That is natural. Right, but then what, what, why, why choose to use the media? It seems like they're dragging Qatar through the mud and ch almost its reputation is, 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 in That's is exactly put into question. That's exactly what is intended. Imagine, imagine a so-called Qatar crisis whereby the borders are closed, diplomatic relations are broken, and nobody hears about it. Yeah. It would be unimaginable. Yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. <laughs> Um, so you definitely predict that this is a show that's coming toward the end. It, it will end very soon, and it will end with more or less normal previous relations being restored between Qatar and the others. And what about between Qatar and Iran? Iran has been a player in the region now for literally four millennia. This is not new. And I predict that Iran will come back into the normal politics of the region, but in a constructive way, not as war or diplomatic crisis. It will take time, mm. but uh, I think it's coming, and I'm quite optimistic on that score. It's very interesting, because I, I think the, uh, what a lot of people have been fearful of is that the, the, the kind of the GCC seemed qu like quite a stable block, and now all of a sudden with Qatar not really along with the rest, that perhaps Qatar would join some kind of a, an alliance with Iran, based on, of course, common interests, but that this would change the balance of power in the region. The, the GCC is far less stable than you think. Uh, these are very fragile, underdeveloped states. They're underdeveloped politically, and they're underdeveloped economically. Some of them are rich, but you can be rich and underdeveloped. It would be a little bit like handing a young child a huge amount of money he mm. doesn't know what to do with it. Right. That is a definition of underdevelopment. I'm an economist. I have to deal with these things on a daily basis. The idea of Iran and Qatar allying together is ridiculous. Uh, I think that the relations between some of these countries and Iran are strong under the table, but to make it public like that serves no purpose for right. the time being. But don't forget that Iran and Qatar are closely linked in their gas interests. Exactly. They share a big gas field, and they are, I believe, the number one and number two gas producers in the region, certainly, and with Russia, two of the top three gas producers in the world. Wow. Super interesting. Um, now, we're going to go back to, uh, if we talk about the conflict here, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What are your views on a regional peace initiative? I have been working hard with colleagues in Palestine, Israel, and elsewhere on something called the Arab Peace Initiative. Mm -hmm. And there is now something called the Israeli Peace Initiative, also known as the Israeli Regional Initiative. The object of this is to push the agreement that was made in the year 2002 among all Arab and Islamic countries, including Iran, but excluding Israel. Israel is not an Arab or Muslim yeah. country. And the, the idea is to establish a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace between the Palestinians and Israel and to have mutual recognition and normal relations. Israel so far doesn't accept this. Mm. Israel, sadly, I think, is living in a bubble. Uh, I'm very sorry to say this. I'm always impressed when I come here by the wealth, by the prosperity, by the technology, it's wonderful. It looks like Northern California, and that <laughs> is a great compliment. Uh, unfortunately, you don't have in parallel an appreciation of the problems and the difficulties of the Palestinians and others 
uh, you are somehow living in isolation here. Mm. This is bad and it's dangerous. And I hope that the activities of my Israeli friends who are working very hard to raise awareness among the Israeli public and also among the key players, including the Knesset members, including the media, and eventually including the government of the Arab Peace Initiative. I'm happy to say that there is much more awareness now than there was five or ten years ago. Mm. So, yeah, hopefully there can be some kind of a, a joining of forces between the Arab Peace Initiative and the regional one. Because this, this is, yes, this sorry is to interrupt. This is one of my key aims as, as a person, as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as a, a Jordanian, as an Arab, as a, a Palestinian exile. Uh, as a friend of people in Israel, not a friend of the state of Israel as it exists today, mm -hmm. uh, with nuclear weapons and a separation wall. This is very bad. But I have many friends here, and I'm proud to call them my friends, and I'm doing this on the record and in public. And I hope that one day we will be able to work together in a confederation or some other form of political union to to make our countries really mm. very, very prosperous. Okay, I, I look forward to that too. Now, tell us a little bit about the panel, uh, the IPS Global Simulation that you're going to take part of. The panel is an annual event, and I have been hopefully successfully, certainly happily, taking the Jordanian role over the last few years. Uh, interestingly, my colleagues on the Jordanian side are all Israelis. Mm. However, they tend to be diplomats, people who have served in Jordan, people who know Jordan. And as always, when I'm part of the simulation, which is this afternoon, I mm -hmm. believe, I suddenly realize what a difficult position Jordan is in. Surrounded by big countries, surrounded by more or less difficult situations, and trying, and I, I repeat, I say this, not just as a, an economist or a geostrategic expert, I say this as a husband and as a father, uh, trying to preserve peace, tranquility, and hopefully achieve some prosperity. This is very difficult. Well, super interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, you spent a lot of your career in Lebanon, and uh, much like Jordan, or perhaps unlike Jordan, it's surrounded by, uh, by a, lo a lot of mess. Uh, in the region and many people many people in Israel are worried about a potential third Lebanon war and you know attacks from Hezbollah they have a huge rocket arsenal directing uh, directed at Israel um, what are your takes on on the president there Michel Aoun is he is he many people believe that he's just you know a puppet of Hezbollah is that something that is of concern to you first of all uh, let me make my position clear on Hezbollah I believe Hezbollah is a legitimate political organization. Mm. It has legitimate political goals. I don't think, and I don't think anybody in Lebanon seriously believes Hezbollah is, quote, a terrorist, unquote, organization, or Hezbollah poses an ex existential threat to Lebanon. Okay. I know many people in Israel believe that. I, b I think they're wrong, number one. Number two, Michel Aoun is definitely not a puppet. Michel Aoun is an unusual man. I think he would be the first to admit that. He's a brave man. He's a soldier by profession, as you know. Mm -hmm. And I think he is a patriot. I think he wants to do the best for his country. He certainly has a lot of mutual interest with Hezbollah. There's a lot of interaction between them, but I don't think he's a puppet. Well, it's very interesting to hear all of your opinions. I wish we had more time, um, but our time is up. So really thank you, Riyad al Khuri, for coming in and sharing your insights with us. And I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. IDC International Radio, 106.2 FM, from Israel to the world.